The ideas that God has for us are much bigger, much broader, much deeper. Can we thank God right now for the, the leading of his spirit and what God is doing in our midst? If you stand with me this morning, I'd like to dismiss our children to Sunday school and turn your attention to Romans chapter 12, starting in verse 1. Romans chapter 12, verse 1. I beseech you, I beg you, I implore you, I do everything in my power to convey to you, therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that you present your bodies a living sacrifice, holy, acceptable unto God, which is your reasonable service. And be not conformed to the pattern of this world, but be ye transformed by the renewing of your mind, that ye may prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. The word of God is calling to the bride of Christ, his church, his body, calling us to be transformed according to the pattern pattern that is Jesus Christ. You know, in in life, I'm so thankful that there are some things that are firm, unchangeable. The revelation of the mighty God in Christ, uh, Jesus said, it's upon this rock that I'll build my church. He's the same yesterday, today, and forever. Some things, they never change. They are certain. But along with those things that are firm like a rock, God has created mankind with a certain level of pliability. If you've ever seen a very old house, the windows in that old house will be thicker at the bottom of the window than they will be at the top. Glass even, as it doesn't appear to be pliable, is actually slowly ever moving. The Bible says that we're like clay sitting on the potter's wheel, still able to be shaped and reshaped. We have a form, but that form is ever being subject to some change. Would you pray with me this morning that we would allow the Word of God to shape us again? Jesus, we're here for you, God, and we're so, so honored, so privileged to be a part of your kingdom, to be amongst your people, God, to be in a place where there's liberty to worship and to experience greater dimensions and depths of you, God. We're so so grateful, so thankful this morning. I ask that you would bless your word as it goes forth, that you would anoint the lips and the, the ears of those that hear it, God, that you would bless the tithes and the offerings, God, and all that we do in conforming to your word, every step, every big thing and every little thing, God, let there be a blessing and a promise that comes to pass. We ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. You may be seated this morning. If you turn in your Bibles with me next to Psalms chapter 37, we're going to camp out here today in Psalms chapter 37. And within this text, as I I don't even remember how I got there. I might have done one of those, it's time to read words, the Word of God, and I just opened up my Bible, and there was Psalms 37. As I started to read, I started to see a pattern within the pattern. And this morning, I I want to bring to your attention some of the very specific patterns that are in this portion of Scripture here in the Word of God, patterns of things that we are to avoid, or commandments of things that we are to avoid, and patterns that God implores us to, to apply to our lives. And to set the stage, we're just going to read the first 11 verses here in Psalms chapter 37, and then we'll come back and we'll, we'll start to, to see the tapestry that's woven here. Reading from Psalms chapter 37, verse 1. Fret not thyself because of evildoers, neither be thou envious against the workers of iniquity. For they shall soon be cut down like the grass, and wither as the green herb. 
Trust in the Lord and do good. So shalt thou dwell in the land, and verily thou shalt be fed. Delight thyself also in the Lord, and he shall give thee the desires of thine heart. Commit, my, commit thy way unto the Lord. Trust also in him, and he shall bring it to pass. He shall bring forth thy righteousness as the light, and thy judgment as the noonday. Rest in the Lord, and wait patiently for him. Fret not thyself because of him who prospereth in his way, because of the man who bringeth wicked devices to come to pass. Cease from anger, and forsake wrath. Fret not thyself in any wise to do evil, for evildoers shall be cut off, but those that wait upon the Lord, they shall inherit the earth. For yet a little while, and the wicked shall not be, yea, thou shalt diligently consider his place, and it shall not be. But the meek, the meek shall inherit the earth, and shall delight themselves in the abundance of peace. Patterns within patterns, woven within the scriptures. Starting at the very beginning of verse 1 in Psalms chapter 37, the scriptures say, fret not thyself because of evildoers. And this fret not thyself is repeated three times with even just these first 11 verses. The Greek word that we read as fret not actually means to don't glow or grow warm. Don't blaze up with anger or jealousy. Don't be burning feeling angry. Don't earnestly be grieved or displeased. In fact, avoid waxing hot. Avoid kindling the fire that starts as just a little thing smoldering that becomes a, a raging fire of emotions. Fret not. I wonder how much energy is wasted getting all worked up about things when God says, fret not. Don't, don't fan the flames of that fire. I myself, uh, I do in fact enjoy a good campfire. Um, you know, not, not the Brother Hoffman scale of a bonfire, but something, something manageable. Uh, several years ago, I built a fire pit, and, and um, as a homeowner, there's trees that grow up and trees that need to be cut down, and, and I don't cut them down just so I can burn them, but when I do cut them down, I stack up the firewood and um, have a fire pit and and oftentimes in the summer months, like we are right now, I'll find myself out there in the morning setting up a fire early, long before anybody else wakes up and spending time with God. I mean, maybe that's my excuse for a campfire all over again. I'm just I'm having a campfire with God. And I've learned over the years that, that um, there's many ways to um, start a fire. And there's, I will even say, many right ways and I remember one, one year, several years ago, my son and I, we were traveling uh, through Colorado camping, and, and I, everywhere we went, the, the wood was wet. The wood was fresh, like they had just cut down these trees, and you don't want that if you're trying to start a fire. And so, um, you know, sometimes to, to get the fire going, you, you find some paper, and you just you start fanning that fire. Well, it didn't matter how much we fanned it on that trip to Colorado, and so I, I remember saying to myself, hey, uh, I'm going to solve this problem in the future. There's ways to do this. And I, I found this little device. It's a portable fan to, to fuel your fire. It's not real strong. I mean, you could cool yourself off with it. I could make noise in the mic with it. Um, but it'll fit in my supplies in the back of my truck along with everything else that I have for camping, which is there 365 days a year just in case camping breaks out in some unexpected way. And so it's come in handy from time to time, but when I'm at home, when I'm not constrained by what I can fit into my truck, when I'm sitting around that, that fire ring and early in the morning, um, I have another tool that I use that's much more effective. If you want to see a fire light up, Brother Smith, you know firsthand, right? This is... This is the fire starting tool that you want, or fire flaming tool that you want. It, 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 it turns into a hot blaze very quickly. It doesn't matter how fresh the wood is, how new it is. If there's any fire, a little bit of smolder, a little bit of smoke. Even the next day, you can come back, to, and you don't even have to get the matches out. or the Well, I don't, I don't use matches. I have a big propane torch that I just set there to light it on fire. So I have, I have the, the biggest and best tools to start fires with. 
Bible says fret not. Don't, 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 don't start putting some wind on that fire. Don't, don't apply things that would cause it to flame up and get worse. Patterns. Psalms 37 and 1 provides us another pattern that instructs us to neither be thou envious against the workers of iniquity. So don't fret, don't don't get all worked up, don't fan the flames of the fire. That's one. And a second one right here is neither be thou envious. This this pattern is repeated again in verse 7. It says, fret not thyself because of him who prospereth in his way, because of the man who bringeth wicked devices to come to pass. Fret not. Don't get all worked up. Don't fan the flames of fire when there is an offense or a hurt. And equally, don't become consumed with the fire that is envy. Don't become envious when we see the prosperity of some non-believers or even those that are of the household of faith. Don't, Don't start to compare ourselves to ourselves fanning the flames of the fire that can grow into a place of I wonder how much of our own spirituality is negated at times when we envy the prosperity of those who have more than we have or have achieved levels of success that we haven't. The pattern of God says, don't worry about what others have. Don't let the fire of their seemingly success fuel discontentment in your own life. It doesn't matter how they got there. It doesn't matter if they deserved it. I'm reminded of a story that Brother Eugene Wilson shared at Midwinter Camp. If you were there, you'll probably remember it too. He was telling a story about these two brothers that were in this church, and they they had this business that had thrived over the years. They themselves were quite uh, wealthy because of it. And their their business, he didn't explain what exactly the business was, but he said that it it thrived on the misfortune of others. A a kind of modern-day tax collector, you might say. I imagine they probably ran like a repo business or uh, who knows, something that took advantage of those that were less fortunate and for their own profit. And eventually, as, as it will be for every person, if the Lord tarries, the, the, the older of the two brothers, he passed away and his uh, slightly younger brother, while making arrangements, met with the pastor of this church and in, in the midst of that co- conversation, um, these two brothers, while they were members of that church, uh, they were well aware that there was a building program that was going on, and this brother, knowing that the, the garment of his older sibling was not one that was white and made ready necessarily for the wedding, he, he offered the pastor a $100,000 donation to the building fund of the program for the church if the pastor would just say some good things about the deceased brother, in itself being another example of the corrupt nature of these two men. And, and without words, the pastor just shook the man's head and said, well, I'll, I'll see you Saturday at the funeral. And on that day of the funeral, the, the minister was torn within himself. I mean, that's a lot of money to pass up. I know he has it. I know that he'll stand by it. He, he in his own mind, no doubt, was weighing the, the cost of his compliance to the request versus the cost of his potential guilty conscience, knowing that everyone knows that this man was no saint. As he ministered to those people on the day of the funeral, the pastor said, while none of us are perfect, this man that lies here before us was truly a saint, especially in comparison to his rotten brother. He told the truth. I hope he got paid. I don't know. Probably not. Let me tell you this morning, we will never prosper if prospering requires to do that which is wrong. Could you make a few more dollars this week if you cheat the time clock like everybody else cheats the time clock? Well, yeah, technically you could. But then through your willful sin of lying, being dishonest with your time card and stealing money that isn't yours from your employer, that blessing that would have been on an honest day's work is removed and making those couple of extra dollars costs you much, 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 much more than what they are worth on their face value. God does not, he does not need our help through wrong actions to open up the windows of heaven and pour out a blessing. But he does need our obedience 
And we do need his blessing. And that only comes one way, to conform to the pattern. In Psalm 73 and 1, David says, Truly, God is good to Israel, even to such that are as of a clean heart. There's a condition that has to be met. But as for me, my feet were almost gone. My steps had well nigh slipped, for I was envious at the foolish when I saw the prosperity of the wicked. I almost lost out with God because I didn't have what I thought I should have had, what others had. And one way to avoid conforming to the wrong pattern is to guard what we put in front of us. David could have avoided his nearly backslidden state had he just not seen some things, exposed himself to some things, imagined himself in some places. We live in a world that is completely intoxicated by the God I have, this and that. But none of those things really matter. We've, we've defined what was once a, a want and decided it's now a need. But the Bible says don't be conformed to the pattern of this world, but be transformed in the pattern of God along with, aligned with that chief cornerstone that is Jesus Christ, conforming to his image, even in the fellowship of his sufferings. In our modern society today, we, we, we don't have idols like we read in the, the Bible, especially in the Old Testament. But don't be fooled. Self-worship is the idol of this modern day. And we all struggle not to bow down at times. Even as children of the Most High God, we are easily led astray by our own selves, our own cares, our own wants, our own carnal nature. If we could just stop worshiping ourselves, perhaps God could get a hold of us to deliver us from our own worst enemy. But you know what I, I wonder? Is God's love for us so great that if we won't get a hold of him for ourselves, if we won't uh, lay down our own idols, perhaps he would let everything around us collapse, everything that we hold on to as normal to, to, to fall apart, to take us just out of a place of complacency for his chosen people to kind of shake us free. My God says, be not conformed according to the pattern of this world, but rather be transformed in the pattern of good works unto Christ. Everything is according to some pattern. What is your life patterned after? What, what do you esteem in your life? What image are you reflecting? Psalms 37 verse 8 goes on to give us another pattern. It says, cease from anger, which literally means to let go of it, to let go of anger. Verse 8 could have been translated, relax and withdraw from that rapid breathing. Let go of your angry countenance. Instead of having a face that shows displeasure, relax and withdraw or cease from those flaring nostrils that show your disappointment. Verse 8 says, cease from anger and forsake wrath. Forsake meaning to let loose, to set your anger free, to liberate it even from your own vessel. To leave wrath behind, to let it alone, to abandon your anger. Ephesians chapter 4 verse 26 says, Be ye angry and sin not. Let not the sun go down upon your wrath, neither give place to the devil. You know, sometimes when we, we start to feel these emotions, even these emotions that are anger, frustration, hurt, disappointment, sometimes we start to beat ourselves up because we feel them, thinking that somehow we've, we've lost our faith or our trust in God because we're, we're feeling these feelings. But anger is not a sin. The feeling of anger is, is in, in itself sinful. So don't shame yourself into thinking that something is wrong with you because you feel things. Jesus Christ felt things too. He was tempted in like manner as we are, yet without sin. So when you feel things boiling over, the Bible says, sin not, fret not. While anger itself is not a sin, anger opens the door to many things. In an instant, anger can produce words that kill. In a moment, anger can do permanent damage, words that just can't ever be taken back. Let not the sun go down upon your wrath, your anger, wrath being defined as bottled up hot displeasure, 
furiously heated with indignation, like a poison. That's what the definition of the word wrath is. Don't let the sun go down while the anger is inside of you, because if, it, if you do, it starts to turn into a poison. Turning our attentions back to Psalms chapter 37, the second half of verse 8 adds yet another pattern for us to conform to. Fret not thyself, and in any ways do not do evil. Avoid bowling over because bowling over may cause you to take a next step into doing something about it. In other words, don't let your bottled up anger cause you to retaliate. Don't trade an eye for an eye. When mankind isn't so kind to you, don't, don't let bottled up anger poison your spirit. Because when we allow this fire of anger to stay ablaze in our hearts, when we fan it with something in our, in our minds over and over and over and over and over again, we can find ourselves stooping to that same low. The same low that the adversary or person or situation that hurts you stoop to and as we try to launch a somewhat kind of counterattack. Let me tell you, two wrongs do not make a right. And of course, as mature Christians, we're not going to be blatant with our counterattack. In most scenarios, we're going to be subtle. We might speak words about that person to their supervisor. We might gossip about them spreading rumors. Not facts, just implying the possibility of their shortcomings because, you know, if we said it outright, that would um, be a breach of our own integrity. And so we just, we just float a few possibilities out there. Sometimes we launch counterattacks by having a party inviting everyone except them because that will teach them. No, it won't. It'll cost you something, though. You'll lose something in the process. These kind of tactics produce more harm than good and primarily for ourselves. You know, anytime I start to feel an urge to try to assert influence or manipulate others to see it my way, I, I need to let that be an alarm that goes off inside of me that says it's time to take a step back. Something's going on here, and it, you're feeling something that's causing you to take an action. You may not want to take that action. You may need to take your hands off of this situation or put some distance between you and it. Verse 9 says that here's the, here's the consequence if we don't. Why, why must we forsake wrath? Why must we choose to put out the fire that sometimes rages in us? Because verse 9 says if we allow that hurt to turn into retaliation, we've, we've crossed the line from victim to perpetrator. For evildoers shall be cut off. But those that wait upon the Lord, those that don't retaliate, those that conform to the pattern and the image, they shall inherit the earth. My friends, God does not need your help to enact judgment. I know being filled with the Holy Ghost sometimes feels a lot like we have superpowers, and in a way it kind of is. We are superhuman. God's Spirit dwelling in us. We, we, we suddenly have the ability to do things we didn't have the ability to do before. We, we see things that we couldn't see before. We have understanding that we didn't have before, and strength, even the strength to overcome this flesh. But even with those superpowers... God has not commissioned us to be the kind of superheroes that take out vengeance on evildoers. That doesn't stop us from trying. When we let ourselves get caught up by offenses, it's like we've been poisoned. And when you've been poisoned, you, you can't see straight. Your mind stops working. So don't let the sun go down on your anger. Don't, don't allow things to grow and fester and become all-consuming. Rather, take a trip to your prayer closet to seek God. He has the antidote. He's the one who can take the good or bad and exchange it for good. But he can't do it unless we, we ask him to do it. To ask God to separate us from these feelings of anger that we're having. To, to tell him even out loud with our own words, here's how I'm feeling. Here's what's happening. He, he already knows, by the way, but there's something about confessing something that our words when exercised become a type of transaction in the spirit when we cry out to God he's, he's so ready and able to listen and if you know your Bible the Bible says that if we, if we won't forgive other people then God won't forgive us 
Peter, he, he too was trying to conform to this pattern as he asked Jesus, well, Jesus, how many times should I forgive my brother? Is, is seven times sufficient? In Peter's mind, he's, he's being generous right now. And Jesus blew Peter out of the water when he replied, Peter, no, seven times 70, or in other words, really as often as they repent. This morning, I want to shed a little bit of light on this very complex word called forgiveness. In the Greek, this word is aphiani. And it's complex because the Greek word that we often read as forgiveness is even more frequently translated into another English word such as leave, left, or let alone. Aphiani more often means to send away or separate from. The, the base word of, that it's based on is focused on separation. That's all it means. And the definition says within itself to let go, to let alone, to let be, to disregard. The same word that we read for, as forgiveness sometimes is to let go, let loose, let alone. Let me give you a very poignant example of this same Greek word we read as forgiveness in Matthew chapter 5, verse 21 that's translated to mean something very different or similar, maybe, to mean separated from or left behind. If you turn your Bibles to Matthew chapter 5, verse 21. Matthew 5 and 21 says, Ye have heard that it was said by them of old time, Thou shalt not kill, and whosoever shall kill shall be in the danger of judgment. But I say unto you that whosoever is angry or wroth with his brother without cause shall be in danger of judgment. And whosoever shall say or call to his brother, Raka, or in modern day English, you're crazy, you don't make sense, shall be in the danger of counsel. The council they're talking about is like those, the Sanhedrin council. But whosoever shall say thou fool or pronounce them to be morally headless shall be in danger of hellfire. Therefore, if thou bring thy gift to the altar and there rememberest that, there, that thy brother hath ought, and that word ought means anything or, or certain thing. So if your brother has all or anything against you, afini, afini, or leave, and separate yourself from making sacrifices. Leave thy gift before the altar and go thy way and first be reconciled or to change the mind and renew a friendship to thy brother, which whoever that brother or sister in the Lord has something against you. And then come or return to the altar and offer thy gift. Here's the clue in this word forgiveness, not always interpreted as forgiveness that the work of forgiveness first starts in us, a pattern within a pattern, you might say. When we use the definition of the same word in parallel with what we know to be true of forgiveness, it's in perfect harmony with the pattern we find in Psalms 37, when people hurt you, be angry and sin not. Rather, separate yourself from those feelings, taking steps to address those feelings first by letting them go, separating yourself from away from that hurt, that feeling, that fire that's wanting to kindle within us and doing it now before the sun sets so that you can avoid the poison of offenses and of course just like for us there is no separation from our sin forgiveness without repentance what do we do then when that other person hasn't repented turn your bibles if you would to luke chapter 17 starting verse 1 where the scriptures give us instructions on what to do After we've taken the time to separate ourselves from our feelings, which sometimes could be a little while and sometimes could be a long while, when we've gone into our own prayer closet, our own private place with the Lord, when we've sought his face and said, God, here's what I'm feeling, here's what I'm thinking, here's what I'm struggling with, I don't want to have these feelings, I don't want to think these thoughts. After we've done that, as often as in many times as we feel them, as, as we've spoken it to God, as we've laid it out, it it will start to distance us from that feeling, that hurt, that thing. The thing that we couldn't get away from suddenly becomes further away from us. And when we get to the place where it's far enough away from us, here's what we ought to do, according to Luke 17, verse 1. 
Then said he unto his disciples, It is impossible, but that offenses will come. But woe unto him through whom they come. It were better for him that a millstone were hanged about his neck, and he cast into the sea, that he should not offend one of these little ones. Take heed to yourselves. If thy brother trespass against thee, rebuke him, or straightly charge him, admonish him. And if he repent, if he change his mind, if he abhor his own past, then affianai, or forgive, or separate his guilt from him. First we separate the feelings within us from ourselves, not through our own power, but through the power of God working in us when we exercise that gift. And when we get to the place where there's enough distance between ourselves and those feelings, then we need to go to that person and address the situation to a phenai or to omit, to let go of the thing that's between us. And if he trespasses against thee seven times in a day, and seven times in a day turn again to thee, saying, I repent, thou shalt forgive him. There is not forgiveness without repentance, but there is a separation that can happen, a, a distancing of yourself regardless of the situation, regardless of the other individual, regardless of whether or not there's repentance, because we don't want to carry that smoldering fire that wants to burn bright. Listen for a moment to the full definition of this word, aphianai, that we sometimes read as forgiveness, and, and see the complexity that's woven within it. This is the, the straight definition of the word, the Greek word. It means to, that, that we read as forgive. It says to omit, letting go, to give something up, to keep no longer. The same word, aphianai, means, that means to forgive, and the Greek literally means to go away from one place in order to go to another place. To depart from one so that all mutual conflicting claims are abandoned. To remove something so that what is left may remain. There's times when we have to put some distance between us and those feelings that want to burn inside of us that would cause us to be poisoned in our own spirit. God paid the price for my sin, removing my sin from me so that what was left could remain. Turn your Bibles with me, if you would, to Matthew chapter 18, verse 15. And here we read some very similar instructions with a very important caveat. The Bible says that there is a right way and a wrong way to confront offenses in this life. Matthew chapter 18, verse 15 says, Moreover, if thy brother shall trespass against thee, go and tell him his fault between thee and him alone. Don't start on Facebook. Don't start in the coffee shop, don't, don't start with your co-workers. If, if there's something, and, and I'll even put a little caveat before the caveat, <laughs> wait some time. Give it at least 24 hours at a minimum. If, if the days start to add up and this thing just keeps coming back in your mind and, and you, you keep feeling that flame and you've already taken it to the Lord and you've, you've already started to put some distance between you and it, if it keeps coming back, well then, yeah, find a time when you can speak to that individual one-on-one -on -one privately. Say, here's what happened. Is that what you meant to happen? Because this is what I felt like it meant. And oftentimes we'll find out, no, not at all. That's not at all what I meant. I'm so glad that you told me. I'm so glad that we're able to, to reconcile. And so the Bible gives us a very clear set of instructions. Go one-on-one -on -one, privately. Don't check with your friends. Don't check with your brothers and sisters Check with God, and then, if still needed, check with them. And there's an escalation path that follows in verse 16, but if he will not hear thee, if they will not hear thee, then take with thee one or two more, that in the mouth of two or three witnesses every word may be established. This isn't a, a, a spiritual police or Gestapo. This is those who are spiritual, those who are humble, those who are meek, those who are willing to intercede on behalf of brothers and sisters, that there may be reconciliation and restoration. Don't go find those people with the loudest mouths that will side with you in order to form a posse so we can take care of the situation. No, go find those who are spiritual. And if that still doesn't work, if that doesn't uh, open up the understanding, if there's still a clear 
Oh, and by the way, those two or three witnesses may help you see a perspective that you didn't see before you get there so you can realize, oh, maybe I did play a role in this. And if that still doesn't have, if that still doesn't sort it out, if it still doesn't open a door for repentance and restoration, there's a, a last escalation step. And this should almost never, if ever, happen. If this person that, that has caused the offense and it's a serious offense and if they neglect to hear you alone and then you with two or three witnesses then tell it into the church bring it before an audience and if they still neglect to hear the church let them be as be as unto a heathen man and a publican church that should never ever happen if ever rarely you know not taking action is an action in and of itself you can say, well, I'm just, I, I'm just waiting to see what happens. I'm, I'm, and there's times to wait. In fact, there should be a waiting period. But if after that period is over, after we've done our part, after we've put some distance between it, no plan is a plan. Withdrawing from confrontation to avoid matters entirely, to pretend as if everything is okay is in itself a false truth. The Bible says, let your yea be yea and your nay be yea. Let your yes be yes or your no be no. Don't, don't project a false truth. According to the pattern of the word of God, the Bible says, fret not. Don't get all worked up. Number two, don't be envious. Don't, don't allow the flames of envy to be stoked in your life don't get caught up with comparing yourself to one another and cease from anger don't don't retaliate be angry and sin not anger is not a sin feelings are normal and when you have those feelings instead of retaliating seek god to help you put some distance between yourself and the feeling to separate yourself it's the beginning of forgiveness so that you might one day be able to confront the issue in a manner that produces repentance and reconciliation and the same principle of separating ourselves from our anger and, and all these pent-up feelings, this same pattern is, that brings emotional healing. We can read in Ephesians chapter 4, verse 30. If you turn there with your, in your Bibles with me now. Ephesians chapter 4, verse 30. Scriptures say that when we, when we hold on to that thing, when we don't separate ourselves, when we don't take steps to mitigate the issue when we allow it to, to fester or we just simply carry it around the rest of our lives. It grieves the Holy Spirit. Verse 30 says, And grieve not the Holy Spirit, whereby ye are sealed unto the day of redemption. How do you not grieve the Holy Spirit? You let all bitterness and wrath and anger and clamor and evil speaking what do you do with it? You let it be put away from you. You, you. you put distance between you and it. Disappointments will come. Offenses will come. What are we going to do with it? That unaddressed situation, if unconfronted, whether it was knowingly or unknowingly, if it's left unaddressed, can become like poison. And if we know it, to be so, according to 1 John chapter 1, verse 6, we need to acknowledge that wrong. And we need to ask that person for forgiveness, whether we meant it or not, whether it was purposeful or not. 1 John 1 and 8 says, if we say that we have no sin, we deceive ourselves, and the truth is not in us. If we confess our sins, God, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. But if we say that we have not sinned, we make him a liar, and his word is not in us. What's even more concerning that is after being confronted, if we still cannot confess, if we're unable to ask for forgiveness, our inability to humble ourselves in itself is a signal that we may have fallen away from that path of truth. If we say we have no sin, we deceive ourselves, and the truth is not in us. Don't wait for someone else to have to point it out to tell us when we hurt them. Don't, don't, don't sweep it under the rug pretending it never happened. Rather, proactively seek out that person that we may have hurt and confess. I, I said something that may have hurt you, that may have wounded you. Did I offend you? If I did, I, I want to make it right. If 
by saying, I'm sorry. Will you forgive me? Oh, in the spirit of confession, I, I feel like I have a confession I'd like to share with you. Last Sunday, I felt very compelled to, uh, to ask a young lady for forgiveness, a junior camper. You see, many of you know I have a great passion for junior camp, and since my accident several years ago, I've been unable to attend, and then add to that now as I regain my health and strength. Life in its season of busyness has, uh, well, keeps me busy. And so as much as I, I planned for and, and, and desired and even set aside time on the calendar to be at junior camp, I, as we got closer, I realized it just it wasn't realistic. It wasn't going to happen. And so I took my plan in my mind of what was going to happen from five days at junior camp down to, well, I could, I could just go for one day one night and I, as I shared with the staff if you, if you follow the pattern you know Monday's a, a kind of crazy first day Tuesday we're starting to learn how to do things and by Wednesday we get in alignment and God moves in such a powerful way and if we still have energy the kids still have energy by Thursday it happens again and so I was like I'm gonna go I'll, I'll pinpoint I'll, I'll show up right at the right time on Wednesday night or on Wednesday and stay overnight and I'll still be able to cover those things that I know I need to that I've already made a commitment to and I was very careful up to that point to, to preface as much as I could. I can't say for sure if I'll be there, but then on that Monday when it came for the week of camp, as I still had this plan to be there on Wednesday night, I met the campers here outside in the parking lot as we were loading up the cars and making sure that they were all accounted for and that they were going to make their way all the way up to camp. And um, one of the campers came up to me and said, oh, you, what do you, you're here, you're not coming with us? I said, no, I'm so sorry, I... Like I said before, I wasn't sure if I was going to be able to, and as it turns out, I'm not, but I'm, I'm planning to be there Wednesday. You see, that, that last part was my mistake. It wasn't a huge mistake, but it was a mistake because I set an expectation that said I would be there Wednesday. Because I wanted to be there Wednesday, and I intended to be there Wednesday, but I still didn't know for sure that I would actually make it. And I'm sorry for this long story, but... That Wednesday, as I'm, I'm going about my day and doing the things that I had to do and, and had already, you know, actually, it, it took me a while, the struggle in myself to let go of the plan I had versus the plan that was going to happen. And as I started to make peace with that myself, um, disappointed, but, you know, there's always next year. The, the dorm mother of this camper get, let her use her phone, and I got a phone call, and I said, Pastor Borman, are, are you on your way? What do you mean, oh, 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 I'm so sorry. I, I did say that, didn't I? I said that I would be there on Wednesday. I, I'm sorry, I'm not going to be able to be there tonight. Oh, oh, okay, that's okay. And said a few more words and hung up. And as the days went on, and they had a great camp, and of course they don't need me there. <laughs> I wanted to be there. That Sunday, last Sunday, as they came back, before service, as I saw that junior camper, and, and again, she was shining, glowing from the Holy Ghost and the experience that she had, it was profound. And I said to this young lady, I said, I, I need to apologize to you. What for? Oh, you haven't, no, 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 I, I need to because I, I said I would be there. And I set an expectation with you and, and then I, I didn't meet that expectation. Will you forgive me? Because I know that adults in your life have been missing the expectations, things that they said they would do that they aren't. And I'm not perfect, but I know enough to know that I've made a commitment that I wasn't able to honor, and so I want to ask you for your forgiveness. And she said, well, of course, gave me a big hug. And that leads me to my next confession which maybe not really be truly a confession because I just whispered it to my wife on the front pew so it's, it was almost resolved but honey, Courtney, I'm so sorry that I don't always tell you all of the stories that I use in sermons 
before I use them in a sermon. It is not because you're not important. It is not because um, I'm hiding something from you. Although in this case, I probably was because I felt guilty. And you know how you knew how much turmoil I was in that Wednesday as I was struggling, even in myself. Like, should I do it? Should I not do it? You had given me the clear go ahead. If if that's what was going to happen, I I could go, but I knew for myself it wasn't going to happen. And and so, please forgive me for not always sharing all of the stories that I share in sermons. And while we're here, if all the things that I say I do that I don't do, I please forgive me. Church, there will be times when I will let you down, when I will not follow through knowingly or unknowingly. If that ever happens, I want to open up the door to you to come to me to say, there's this thing that's been inside of me. It's just smoldering. But, but it hasn't gone away. I, I just need to ask you about this. Is, is this what you meant? Or remember when I asked and you said yes, but you didn't? I, I want to open the door to every one of you to say, please, don't let that fire smolder. Please come. Let me know the situation if I cause it knowingly or unknowingly and and if in any case let me ask for your forgiveness let me repent this morning if you'd stand with me as our musicians come there's more patterns in this portion of text that we just don't have time for this morning and perhaps another time the lord will open up that door patterns of things that we should do there's one last one, though, I would like to touch on, and it's the pattern in verse 7 that says, Rest in the Lord and wait patiently for him. Isaiah prophesied of this rest in the Lord when he said, To whom he said, This is the rest wherewith ye may cause the weary to rest, and this is the refreshing, yet they would not hear. Jesus proclaims in Matthew 11 and 28, Come unto me, all ye that, are, that labor and are heavy laden, and I will give thee rest. Hebrews 4 and 11 says, Let us labor, therefore, to enter into that rest, lest any man fall after the example of unbelief. For the word or the utterance of God is quick and powerful and sharper than any two-edged sword, that rhema word of God, that Holy Ghost. When we pray in the Holy Ghost, we labor to enter into that rest, and the Spirit of God speaks his perfect will into our lives, knowing exactly where we are in every situation Verse 7 says, rest in the Lord and wait patiently for him. Wait for God to fight your battles. Be patient, letting patience have her perfect work, according to James 1 and 4. God said his people ought to pattern themselves, not according to the world, but according to himself and his word to be delighted in him. This morning as we open up this altar, as we invite you to come, it might be a good opportunity to take a, a moment of reflection, to take an inventory of ourselves, to look for any potential smoldering ashes or weights that we've been carrying, regardless of where they came or how they came. God wants to put some distance between you and that thing, that feeling, that weight, that hurt. It is God's will that there be healing in our emotions, in our spirits, that there would be reunification and reconciliation between brothers and sisters in the Lord, that there would be one body, one Lord, one faith, that we would walk in unity, that we would see the victory for ourselves, for our friends, for our family, for our community. But we have to do it according to the pattern. There's no other way. Would you come this morning?